Okay, good afternoon and thanks to everyone um, who's joining us for the next uh, in the CREMS webinar series. And the focus of the webinar, which will be sh uh, starting just shortly, um, is on assessing with efficiency, so advances in the measurement of mental and substance use disorders. And we have um, Dr. Matt Sunderland, who I'll introduce in a moment, who'll be talking to us today. So my name is Lexine Stepinski and I'm um, chairing the session uh, and we'd really like you to, to encourage you uh, to put in, to ask any questions or make any comments that you have along the way and you can do this, you'll see on your control panel there's a questions box um, so you can submit any questions at all and then we'll have a QA and a at the end uh, where Matt, Matt will be answering those questions. Now this is um, the third in our um, 2016 series um, of webinars and as you'll see our, our program covers a number of topics relating to the understanding, prevention and treatment of mental health and substance use disorders and what we have um, coming up for the rest of the year in September we have another uh, webinar looking specifically at the maturing adolescent brain and implications for prevention of drug and alcohol problems. So that will be um, presented by Louise Mewton. And then um, on the 25th of November, we have another webinar which is looking at the behavioural activation, I'm sorry, looking at behavioural activation for the treatment of depression among substance users. So if you're interested, we'd really encourage you to go along to our website and register um, for those webinars or you can also join our mailing list to receive updates about all of the webinars in the series. Um, and if that wasn't enough webinars for you, in addition, um, we've had um, a whole host of webinars over 2015 and earlier in 2016, and you can watch all of these webinars um, on demand, so the videos and access the handouts. And so if you visit our uh, website, so comorbidity.edu.au training webinars, you'll be able to access all of that information. Uh, so just before I introduce Matt, um, if you're joining us for the first time today, I'll just uh, give you a little bit of an overview about what CREMS is um, and what we do here at CREMS. So CREMS stands for the NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use and what we're about is conducting research to improve our understanding of mental health and substance use disorders and understanding in particular how and why these problems co-occur. And in addition, we're working to develop improved strategies and conducting research to identify the most effective ways to prevent and treat these problems. So to achieve these aims, we work closely with our schools, services, community groups, and this webinar series is another way that we can foster these lines of communication. And so you can see here um, the CREMS team um, and with our director there in the very bright um, pink, Professor Marie Thiessen, you can't miss her. <laughs> okay, so without more introduction, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Matt Sunderland, who we're really pleased to have um, give us some of his time today. So Matt is an NHMRC Early Career Research Fellow and his main research interests include psychometrics, psychopathology and epidemiology. And in particular, he's really interested in developing efficient uh, instruments, diagnostic instruments for comorbid conditions that use the underlying dimensional constructs such as internalising, externalising and thought disorders. So thank you so much, Matt, for joining us today and I'll pass over pass over now so you can tell us all about how to assess, assess more efficiently. Great. All right. Thanks, Lexine, for that introduction. And, and thank you, um, everyone out there, for joining us on this webinar today. Hopefully, it will be interesting and hopefully, you'll get something uh, incredibly useful out of it. Um, so as Lexine mentioned, um, this webinar is going to be focused on psychometrics today, specifically item response theory and how we use item response theory and how we apply that to the measurement of mental health and substance use disorders. Um, I'm going to be focusing on some of the unique aspects of IT that make it really suitable to develop efficient and precise instruments. Um, I've tried to get this webinar probably as, as a basic whirlwind introduction to the topic, highlighting some of the recent work by myself and my colleagues um, in the hope that Perhaps you can use this uh, webinar and, and might inspire some people who want to explore some of these topics in a bit more detail to then go off and actually investigate some of the specific topics that I, use, I talk about in more detail. 
Um, of course, if you have any questions as I go through, or if I'm talking nonsense as you don't understand, please write it down and, and we can talk at the end, clarify any details or give you the opportunity to ask questions. So a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, as I said, I'll give a very brief and simple introduction to item response theory. I'll then talk about how we can use IIT to form things called item banks and common metrics and how we can use common metrics to link different scales that measure a similar uh, construct. Um, I'll then talk about a quick summary of how we can use IIT to develop brief screening scales uh, that can be administered in a static way um, and also discuss how we've done this in the past and are currently doing this. I'll then finish up by talking about how IRT uh, can be used to develop adaptive tests, uh, which are highly efficient ways to measuring something that we want to measure without losing as much precision as we do when we administer short scales in a static fashion, meaning that everybody's administered the same short number of items. So let's begin with the brief introduction of IRT. Um, I'll just warn, these are the, probably the hardest slides and the hardest things to understand, um, so I'll go slow through these um, couple of slides. So in IIT, we kind of approach the measurement of individuals from a slightly different perspective than how we usually measure disorders in a traditional sense. So traditionally, we might measure something by getting a collection of items, administering those items to a person or a sample, then getting their responses and simply summing those responses together in order to form a total severity score. In essence, the sum becomes the severity score and they're one in the same. There's no distinction between uh, the person's severity score and the items that we give them. Essentially, we say that these test scores are dependent on the items, so we can only interpret their severity scores in the, in the, in the sense of that particular test and only compare scores against people who have taken that test. In IRT, have a different assumption. We state that all individuals have a pre-existing ability level and it's the test item's job in order to um, try and figure out or make a best guess at what this true ability level is. Because we make this assumption, there's a separation between the person's true ability level or the score or the scale of the metric and the specific items. They're separate. So we say that IRT considers uh, ability scores to be test independent. So that's a key point to IRT and, and having that separation of ability scores and test items enables us to develop really highly efficient instruments in the future and I'll, and I'll talk about that as we go along in this webinar. The second point about IRT is that we take into consideration the individual item properties and how each of these items relate to the ability score rather than just focusing on the total scores, the total sum scores. In IIT, we state that there can be some items that are indicative of more severe levels of the thing that we're trying to measure, the construct that we're measuring, and there are less severe items, and so each of these items has unique properties that we want to take into consideration and use. The th so the third point is the key to IIT, and that is we have these items and we have the ability scores, and we want to try and link them together on a common scale. And this is achieved by going out and collecting data on a whole bunch of a whole bunch of people, taking the information that they provide on their responses, and then using that information to plot uh, each of the items where they provide the most information about the specific uh, severity level of that particular person. So that's some pretty heavy stuff there. Um, what does it actually mean? Well, I hope to try and explain in a bit more detail by providing an example about how item response theory works and calibration itself. So let's start by having a test, and this test contains six items. And we assume that people come to this test with a pre-existing ability level. The number of test items doesn't determine the scale that we want to set, so the scale isn't between zero and six in this instance. Instead, um, it doesn't matter what combination or different items that we use, a person's ability score should always be the same. So we make the assumption that most abilities are distributed in the population on a normal distribution with the bulk of people, I hope you can see my curse here, the bulk of people fitting uh, in between the, in the middle of it on the average with less people in the lower levels of severity and, and less people in the upper levels of severity. So we, because we make this assumption, um, we can then set a scale around this assumption. And that scale is traditionally set in IRT with a mean of zero and a standard definition of one. So instantly, these, this scale has uh, a meaning. 
if someone gets a score of zero, then they're average in terms of their severity level or their ability level, whatever we are measuring. If they get a score of minus two, then they're less severe. If they get a score of plus two, they're more severe. And so everyone will fall in between pretty much minus three and plus three. And this is where all uh, our scores are set. Um, so now we need to begin the process of calibration. That is, let's take these six items and figure out where they sit on this scale that we've just developed. What, how can we use these items to, in the future to tell us about where a person's uh, severity might be? So let's start by looking at the first item. And it just so happens that this is a hypothetical example about um, questions of depression um, and symptoms of depression. Only six, not the full uh, nine, but it's just a hypothetical situation. Uh, the first question being is whether you have felt sad. Um, now this question, and we use information to try and identify where this uh, question fits on the severity, and as it turns out, this is actually a, quite a common feeling. Everyone feels sad every now and then. It's not particularly indicative of a severe depressive state. Because of this, we say we state that this item is, is linked to a lower level of severity around the, below the minus two level. So. Anybody who says yes to this symptom, we know that their scores will be above this point on the continuum. Anyone who says no to this symptom, we know that they're not severe at all, and so their scores will be very low on this continuum. We then look at the next item, and we say that this is asking about loss of interest. Um, loss of interest probably is not felt by as many people as feeling sad is. So we say that this symptom is probably more indicative of a higher level of severity. It just so happens that in this situation, we have majority of people will have felt sad, but it's an even split. So 50% of people won't feel it, 50% will feel it. So it's bang on in the middle. It's average. This, this loss of interest measures an average level of severity. We then have a cluster of four symptoms. And these four symptoms, oh, sorry, just scrolling ahead too fast cluster of four symptoms um, which are rarely experienced by the population. And so we deem these four to be indicative of high levels of severity. So in order for a person to endorse this, they need to have quite a high level of severity, and very few people above them will actually endorse these uh, questions because only the highest severity people will endorse them. So in short, the process of calibration is about using pre-existing data and the assumptions of the measurement model to try and link whatever items that we have uh, to this scale that we've set up. And once we have this information, we can then go ahead in the future and collect um, information about these items, the, the responses to these items, in, in order to infer where a person's severity ability level sits on this continuum. We can also start to see some of the properties of the test itself. As you can see, this test contains more items that cluster in a, a relatively small area of upper severity. Therefore, this test provides us with more information about this level of severity than it does about lower levels of severity because we only have two items here. So if we go and administer this set of six items to people in the future, if someone sits in the high level of severity, we'll be more confident in our score on that person than we will be on a score with someone who is lower level of severity. So this is IRT in a nutshell, and this is how we can use this information. Uh, we can use this information in going forward to actually start to tailor and select which items we want to administer, but administer to people. It becomes a very cool situation where you have adaptive testing, which I'll talk about in, the, in, the, in uh, a moment. So essentially that is IRT in a nutshell, and that's a very simplistic version of IRT. Um, I do encourage anyone who wants to investigate more about IRT to check out some of these resources, particularly the first book um, uh, by Embertson and Rees, Item Response Theory for Psychologists. It's getting a little old now, but it's still very relevant, I and mean, it contains some really good descriptions of, of IRT and how it compares to uh, classical test theory, which is how we usually um, develop instruments. And, it probably does a better description of IT than I've just given it. So go check that out if you want more information. So now I want to actually talk about three issues or three kind of topics um, in IT uh, and how we can apply IT in practice. The first being development of item banks and um, common metrics. 
and how we can use these to kind of link together um, two different scales that are supposedly measuring the same thing. So the first question, um, what is an item bank? Um, well, essentially it's the label we give to a collection of items that supposedly measure a particular ability or disorder. So an item bank might reflect items from a single instrument or it could reflect a series of items that are collected from various uh, instruments. So if we want to measure depression, for instance, we could collect a whole bunch of items that measure the depression from different instruments and put them all on the same scale. It's because we're actually interested in what the individual item tells us about the severity scale, not the actual total sum score, which is what we do in traditional approaches. It doesn't actually matter uh, where the instrument comes from, as long as we calibrate all those um, items onto the same scale same scale that we're measuring here. So before we had an item bank of, say, six items, um, and as I kind of described, those six items were not particularly useful given that there were big gaps in, this, in, the, in the scale where there were no items for, to provide information for. So I, I, you probably guessed that to have a good item bank, the key point is to have a sufficient number of items that provide information along all points of the ability scale so that we can be confident in a person's ability scale using these particular items no matter where they sit in terms of severity. So if a person is really high in severity, then we have the items here to actually measure that person's severity. If they're low, then we have those items here to measure um, that level of severity as well. So essentially an item bank is just the collection of items that we have calibrated to the IIT model. The second question. Um, how do we go about actually building an item bank? Well, my colleagues and I have recently established a series of item banks to measure um, individual mental and substance use disorders as part of an NHMRC project grant. And in that grant, we kind of um, developed a, a more of a systematic approach to actually developing an item bank. And we also borrowed from some methodologies used previously by uh, the Promise Initiative, which is a big um, initiative uh, dedicated to developing these IRT measures for health and, and, and mental health. So I'll just go through some of the steps that we used in that process. Um, the first step I mean, starts like any other research project um, and it starts with a comprehensive search of the literature in order to try and uncover as many instruments and items as possible that target a particular disorder, so social phobia or depression or GAD. We then pull all those items together remove some of the duplicates and kind of standardize um, all the items on a common response scale, so either yes, no, or the Leichhardt scale of zero to four and how often they've actually experienced that symptom. And we also standardize to a common time frame. Um, our time frame was have you experienced these symptoms in the past 30 days. We then take those large set of item pools and we um, give uh, consumers and experts a chance to provide feedback on those particular items. Um, we ask them to rank the relevance and importance of each of these symptoms in order to increase the validity and utility of those item pools. And we also use this information to try and refine the item banks even further by removing uh, non-relevant items, uh, items that had significant content overlap, um, items that were deemed ambiguous or difficult to comprehend. And so what we're left with is a series of um, reduced item banks that target each of these eight disorders that we were targeting. Um, and I've drawn a line here for one reason. That is, it's, it, it's at this point where you now have a sufficiently reduced set of um, item banks that you now need to go out and collect data from. So you can then use that data to calibrate each of those item uh, banks to the IT model. So in our situation, we utilise Facebook to advertise for participants to provide responses uh, to each of the items in the banks. And once collected, we were able to test the assumptions of IIT. Um, you know, IIT has several assumptions that you do need to test to make sure that the items um, uh, 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 correspond, fit well with these assumptions. And we also took the opportunity here to try and um, remove some of the items that weren't uh, following these assumptions, and so we were able to reduce the item banks even more. And then, of course, once we had the final item banks, we were able to use the data that we had to calibrate each of these items um, to the IRT metric, the common scale, uh, using the process I just described. So we have two papers um, 
corresponding to each kind of both aspects of this um, of these steps published and that you can go and check out if you want. Um, the first is the first four steps. So, and we, we actually made the definition of item pools for the first four steps and then we, we have item banks for the last three steps. It's an artificial um, difference, but in order to make it clear of what we're talking about, we called the steps in the first four creating item pools and the, the last three steps creating item banks. So as you can see, we, we uncovered a, a great deal, a, a very large number of items, 6,900 across each of the eight mental health conditions. Are we able to narrow that down to 2002, which were standardised and rated by um, the small groups of consumers and experts? And based on their feedback, we were able to substantially reduce the item pools even more to form um, item pools ranging between 45 and 75 items uh, that, that measure each of these um, eight mental and substance use disorders. The second study is now published in Psychiatry Research and this basically talks about how we went out and used these item pools and collected data on them from 3,175 uh, respondents. We tested all the assumptions and we found that there were several items that didn't meet the assumptions of the IT model. So we removed those items and we had each bank consisting of between 19 and 47 items. Um, so these are, you know, relatively large item banks to measure each individual disorder. So that's the, the idea of item banking um, and how you might go about actually forming an item bank. Another topic that has considerable promise in the field of mental health and substance use and one that's uh, related to the idea of item banking is that of scale linking. So I'll just try and provide an example of what I mean by scale linking. So say we have uh, two instruments. Both instruments supposedly measure depression, uh, the Beck Depression Inventory and the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale. Both have been used in a variety of different studies and samples, but say we want to take scores from a sample measured using the BDI and compare them with scores using the SSD. If we just use the simple sum scoring, it's difficult to compare them because both of them are two different scales. BDI has a different number of items as SSD, and so it's difficult to actually compare these two scales. More than that, we're not actually too sure about whether the BDI might represent, might contain items that represent lesser levels of severity than the SSD, because they're on two different scales, and they can only be interpreted uh, within the test itself. But as I mentioned, IRT is about taking individual items and placing them on a common scale this scale that we kind of set up at the start. So in order to kind of compare these two instruments, we first need to collect data and then calibrate these items from both the scales onto the common metric. So in order to do this, we actually have to collect data from people who are administered both samples, uh, both, both instruments, and then use the information they provide in order to calibrate items from both instruments onto the same metric, similar to how we would build the item bank. Now, given properties of IIT in the fact that um, the ability scores are test independent, it doesn't actually now matter if they're all calibrated on the same metric about which subset of items we choose to test someone on because they'll provide us with the same information and provide the same scores as, um, as, as using a different type of subset of items. So because of this, um, we can take the subset of the BDI items and administer that to a person and score them and provide scores on this common metric. Whereas we can also take items from the SSD, score another person and provide scores on this same metric. And therefore they're directly comparable rather than having two separate scales which are, aren't easily compared do this for everyone and we're effectively able to combine two independent samples that are administered using um, two different but related scales. Now remember the scales have to be related. We have to be confident that they're both measuring depression. If you think about it, if we calibrate a large network of instruments onto a common scale, we can effectively standardise uh, the measurement of depression and enable or facilitate um, large data linkage projects. Um, the, probably the main challenge with this type of work is finding uh, enough people to actually um, 
administer five or ten measures that measure the same thing. You start to get a large degree of respondent burden after the person completes the seventh measure of the measuring depression. But once we have that data and once we can establish um, a common metric for all these different instruments, it becomes really cool in the future to link different samples using um, different measures. Um, here is a few good references that demonstrate um, some of these IRT linking procedures that you might want to check out in the future. Um, this is a, a German group who have actually kind of linked 11 self-report measures of depression, um, which is quite a large linking project, um, as well as the Promise Initiative, which has kind of linked um, depression to their metrics, as well as uh, measures of GAD to their metrics. But other than depression and GAD, um, data linkage, or scale linkage, sorry, hasn't been actually done quite extensively for um, mental health and substance use disorders. I also want to point out that there is a cool um, website that you might want to check out, um, www.commetrics.org. And this actually is a, a website that provides the ability for researchers to use their data and say they collected data on the BDI. They would enter that raw data into one of their applications and that application will automatically score that raw data to the IIT common metric so that you can then compare those rescored um, score, re data to um, any other types of data that have also been rescored to the common metric. So the third topic, the third overview um, topic is talking about um, how we might go about developing efficient measures of depression or of uh, substance use uh, using IRT. So let's start again with an example. Um, and we, we start with our, our scale that we set up uh, in order to try and measure whatever we want to measure, say depression. We also have an item bank. And this item bank uh, contains many items that target the full continuum of the severity scale. So we actually have a good item bank here. Now, of course, we can use items, um, we can use all the items in the, in the bank to measure someone on this scale and, and really have a fine um, tuned, um, pinpoint their, their level of severity because we have such a large number of items. So for this particular person, um, they would say yes to all these questions, but then no to all these. And because there's so many and there's a small interval between the questions, we can actually start to have high precision around our scores. But thinking in a practical sense, um, so item banks can consist of 100 plus items and it's not always possible or feasible um, to actually administer a large number of items to generate severity scores with high levels of precision, uh, particularly in settings where you want to administer multiple measures to test, uh, to examine multiple different constructs um, or, or settings where you want to kind of regularly test someone to monitor outcomes. So. If we know from IIT that we can use any particular subset of items in the bank to generate scores on the same severity scale, it's possible to actually reduce these number, the number of items you administer and only select a few good quality items that target the full continuum of the scale. So instead of administering 100 plus, we might only want to administer you know, eight or nine, and these nine are more um, widely dispersed along the continuum uh, than we do for the full item pool. The differences here is that we will have less precision around our person score. They'll be on the same metric, but we won't be as confident that these we're, we're you know, targeting their true ability level as we would be for the full item bank, purely because we're using less information, less items. So that's how we go about actually um, kind of developing short screening scales from larger item banks. Um, there are many examples of, of screening scales developed using IIT, um, particularly from the Promise Initiative. Uh, if you go to their website, www.assessmentcenter.net, um, they have provided a very good free um, screening scales to measure things such as depression, uh, anxiety, alcohol use, drug use, as well as many other um, outcome measures for physical health and functional impairment. I've also been involved in a study that's used IRT in a particular type of IRT called non-parametric IRT 
um, to select optimal items from the SIS and SPS um, instruments. And these two scales measure social phobia. Um, and if anyone wants to have a copy of that paper, um, I'm more than happy to send it to them. Um, but we are also currently in the process of developing um, short scales for those kind of newly developed item banks that I talked about. Um, and at the moment we're still working on that, but I'll, I'll talk quickly about an example of panic disorder just by showing you um, the correlations between the short form and the full version. So if you look here, uh, our full item bank to measure panic disorder contained 19 items, so actually quite a small item bank in, in, in comparison to other um, constructs. However, we, are, we were able to select um, four items, four optimal items that covered the full continuum and then we scored people on those four items and compared it to the full item bank and we found that they were very highly correlated of a 0.93 correlation, indicating that essentially um, our short form is measuring or providing the same scores as the full 19 items, a 79% uh, reduction in items. We also compared these two versions to uh, the PADIS, which is a, a, an independent scale measuring panic disorder, and we found high correlations of 0.78 and 0 0.8, uh, demonstrating that our new instruments, our outer banks, uh, have good validity and they're targeting uh, what we think is panic disorder. And, and also, these two correlations are essentially the same. Um, so just again showing that our short form is doing a very similar job as the full 19 items. So, um, that's how you develop brief scales based on IoT, by selecting optimal items with good um, item characteristics that cover the full continuum of the scale. But, of course, because we're gaining in efficiency, um, we have to sacrifice something which is precision. So, because we're using less items, we aren't as confident around a person's uh, true ability score as we would be if we use the full um, item bank. But what if we wanted to maintain a high degree of efficiency and also maintain a high precision as possible? So use as few items as possible, but also still maintain a level of precision where we're confident that person's score, um, that, that estimated score represents their true score. To do this, we need to forget about kind of administering scales in a static fashion, meaning that everybody gets the same number of items. And instead, we need to start um, tailoring the administration of the item bank to each individual person. Uh, this tailoring is known as computerized adaptive testing or CAT. So how does CAT work with IRT? Um, again, let's start with our severity scale and also we have an item bank that contains a large number of items that target um, each point along the continuum. And we also, these items have been calibrated to this bank, so we know where each item sits along this severity scale. We then take this and we want to administer um, this test to a person. So what we might do is we might take an item from the bank uh, that targets an average level of severity, and we administer that item to the person, and we get their response. That response is the positive that this person has this symptom. Because they have this symptom, we then know that, or we probably know that their score will sit somewhere above this point on the continuum. Because of that, the computer then takes the next best item within this range on the continuum and ignores administering any items within the lower levels of the continuum. So the next item might be a really severe item, an item that targets a really severe level of depression or whatever it is you're measuring. We get the person's response, and this, this instance they say, no, I don't have that symptom. And so we now know that it must be between these two points in the continuum. So the next, the computer then selects an aspect item. This, this is a, a score of two, so two standard deviations above the mean, quite a high severity item. And in this instance, the person says yes. Therefore, we know now that their range probably is within this two to three range. The computer then continues to administer items in this way until we reach a desired level of precision. Um, the, the, the level of precision is improved because we're selecting more items around the person's 
probable level of severity than we would be if we were administering this uh, tool statically. If we're administering it statically, we have to include additional items that target the full continuum and therefore we lose our level of precision. But if we're able to tailor it, we increase level of precision whilst we're preventing the administration of any items that are redundant. So, of course, because it's administered, um, it, it, we're tailoring each administration to each person, um, another person might come along and have a very different set of items presented to them. The first item will always be the same because that's establishing a um, initial score. But the next item, if they said no to this, might be one of low severity. If they said yes to that, we'd know it's in this lower severity range. If they said yes to this, we know it's higher, higher, higher again until we reach a um, desired level of precision and we terminate the test. So that is an overview of how IRT, or sorry, CAT works. Um, I want to just give you a quick example of how we've used um, IRT and CAT to try and measure comorbidity um, in, and specifically trying to measure comorbidity between mood and anxiety disorders. So we've, we've found in the literature and in data and epidemiological data um, that mood and, and anxiety disorders are highly comorbid. It's quite rare to see someone um, who has depression and does not have some um, indication of anxiety or some other type of anxiety disorder. Some studies have indicated that this high degree of comorbidity um, indicates that there is perhaps a single common factor that accounts for this relationship, so a liability we're experiencing all of these mood anxiety disorders. Therefore, perhaps we can get um, and focus on scores on the single factor rather than actually independently measuring each um, five or six different anxiety disorders. So we thought it might be good to actually try and measure this broad domain that captures this information about all mood and anxiety disorders, um, but using as few items as possible. Because if you think about it, if you start to measuring five or six disorders, the number of items that you have will start to increase and increase. So we thought that CAT might be a really good um, technique to use to reduce the number of items presented. So I first started by setting up our item bank um, that the CAT would use to select items from. Uh, given that we're interested in comorbidity of mood and anxiety disorders, I decided to combine our item banks for the separate disorders together um, into a single large item bank. So I took our item bank for major depression, social anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder, and combined them all into a single bank. And that comprised 133 items. Clearly something that would not be practical to administer regularly in a busy uh, clinical setting. So I'm, I calibrated these items on the um, IRT metric using a bifactor model. It's a specific type of um, IRT multidimensional model, but um, if people want more detail on the bifactor model, they can, I, I'm happy to provide more information afterwards. But the main idea of the bifactor model is we can focus on this internalizing common factor, that is what is shared across all these five disorders um, that might put someone at a greater predisposition to experiencing mood and anxiety disorders. I then scored individuals using an adaptive algorithm, um, maintaining a level of precision while using as few items as possible. And then I examined um, the correlations between the internalizing SCAT, uh, CAT and the full form, um, as well as other short screening scales, disorder specific screening scales, and DSM-5 diagnoses of each of these five disorders to see, uh, to try and get an indication of validity of this, of this new CAT measure. Um, we found that the CAT actually performed really well. Um, it it um, administered, on average, 28 items. Now, remember, each person has a different administration of the item bank, so that they can have more items or, or, or less items, but on average, people were administered about 28 items, which represents an average decrease of 79%. Precision was high. Um, uh, average reliability was 0.86, um, which is considered high, I think the full item bank of 133 items generated an average uh, reliability of about 0.92 or something like that. So not much of a decrease considering we're dropping quite a large number of items. 
important point is the correlation between our cat version and the full bank was very high at 0.93. Essentially, is saying that our scores are one and the same. Correlations with the brief disorder-specific screening scales range between 0.5 and 0.82, so between moderate to good. Um, I think the, the relationship between internalizing and the OCD-specific scale was lower than the other disorders. And our internalizing CAT scores were able to significantly differentiate between cases and non-cases um, for all five disorders. So someone with a higher severity level on the internalizing were more likely to have um, all of the disorders. So essentially, this uh, common internalizing CAT is doing its job in, in detecting a predisposition to experiencing all disorders. So that's just kind of wrapping up now. Um, IIT has really great potential to improve the validity, efficiency and precision around um, measuring mental health and substance use disorders. Um, IIT has been used heavily in the education field but relatively less in the field of mental health and substance use disorders. Um, we hope to continue to develop instruments in this area, particularly uh, instruments that measure broad levels of comorbidity. Um, so the, the notion of internalizing, we also have developed CATs to uh, measure broad level of externalizing, which is um, a predisposition to using substances as well as um, having callous aggression type traits. And I think the next probably step is um, to make some of the, the, these IIT instruments freely available to researchers and clinicians and um, developing online measurement portals and apps um, in order to kind of encourage the use of IIT measures and, and facilitate the scoring of IIT. So thank you. Um, that's the webinar. Again, a very quick, brief overview of IIT and several different topics. Um, if you have any questions, please start to ask them out. Feel free to drop me an email at any time. Um, I, I must mention, though, I'm going on leave starting on Monday for four <laughs> weeks. So if you um, want to drop me an email, I'm not ignoring your email. I'll just get to it um, when I come back in four weeks' time. So thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Okay, thank you so much, um, Matt. And for those that do have questions or comments, we'd love to see them. So just um, putting them through on your control panel there in the questions box. Um, and I just wanted to say you've done a great job of really um, simplifying some <laughs> really complicated <laughs> content there. So I loved your example about um, IRT, you know, where you just showed us so not knowing much about um, item response theory myself and it's something that's a really kind of abstract well, group of words mm. anyway. So when you show show those items and show what it actually means, that really, um, yeah. well, I certainly learned something yeah. today, so I'm sure everyone did. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, and that's the main thing. As long as I'm learning something, we're doing well. And also, um, yeah. just every time you present on this, I think um, it's just amazing that with so the example that you gave, of, I think with panic, that four items we can do as good a job yeah. as 19. And at the clinical psychologist, I'm sure lots of people out there are going, yeah, I could really use that kind of efficiency. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. In assessment, and the so yeah, we will definitely for screening purposes. I think it's very useful. Mm. So you gave us some links to other um, sites where there are sort of other resources. Um, I guess efficient kind of measuring tools. So that's great for yep. everyone to have. So the handout will be available on our website um, sometime this afternoon. Uh, so if people download that, they'll be able to have the, all of those links that you've provided as well. So, okay, so um, now if we take some, some questions, so I guess um, the first really important question is if we've got people in the audience that are sitting there thinking, wow, this stuff is great, um, I'd love to do some of this, how, how would you recommend they go about that? What kind of software um, would they oh, need yep. to use to run these analyses? Yep, so there are there's several um, kind of IRT um, software out there to actually score and calibrate items onto the IT metric. Um, some of the ones that I use um, in particular is a program called FlexMert. Um, but you do have to pay for a subscription for FlexMert, um, but it's it's definitely one that people might want to check out. However, if, if people know how to use R, the R software, um, there are some packages out there that are free to use 
the actually really good packages to um, essentially calibrate IRT um, items to the IRT metric as well as score your data using the IRT metric. Uh, one particular package is called MIRT, M-I-R-T, and of course R has a slightly more um, steep learning curve um, than are the kind of the dedicated IRT packages. However, the benefit is that they're free. Um, of course, if people are interested in learning how to use any kind of IRT package um, or FlexMert, I have lots of template syntax um, in order to demonstrate how IRT can be calibrated and scored. So if people are interested in this, feel free to email me and I can actually provide you with um, syntax or programs um, that describe how to calibrate IRT as well as score um, raw data using IRT. So more than happy to share that. Fantastic. Okay. I might even take you off on that offer. That sounds good. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So uh, I guess another oh sorry, another question that's just come through as well is asking for a little bit um, more information on your work with mental health. So that kind of overlap, you've talked a lot about comorbidity, um, mm -hmm. mental health and substance use. And I guess yep. some examples I I'm assuming of how you can use this content in that particular realm. Mm -hmm. um, so like how do we measure overall mental health and substance use? Yeah, I guess how do you apply the things that you've talked about today to that concept yep. of the comorbidity between mental health and substance use? Yes. Sure, sure. Um, I definitely think that developing these broad instruments that measure comorbidity, such as internalising and externalising, um, as well as kind of the other broad measures such as thought disorder, which targets um, kind of um, psychosis and schizophrenia. By developing really efficient instruments that measure these broad domains, we can actually start to put together a broad profile of what a person's comorbidity might look like. Instead of having a list of you know, 10 or 15 different disorders that a person might not have, we can just focus on these three broad domains that really give us a good indication if someone is more prone to feeling internalising disorders or more prone to externalising or a combination of both because we can model these three um, broad factors together and we can see that there are strong correlations between internalising and externalising and internalising and thought disorders and so on and so forth. So it's really about taking um, measurement and trying to redefine how we classify um, mental disorders. So instead of just focusing on DSM ca categories, we can focus on these broad dimensions and try and provide a bit more fine-grained information um, at the broad level about how disorders might occur and be present in the population and what that might mean then for treatment. So what types of treatment might we use if someone has both internalising and externalising, you know, the kind of the transdiagnostic approaches to treatment. Mm. Uh, these scales, because they're transdiagnostic scales, are probably well suited to um, be linked in with those kind of transdiagnostic approaches. Um, this kind of work is also trying to get really fine-grained, um, precise instruments you know, efficient instruments is also really suitable for um, tailored treatments. So there's a new kind of wave of treatments coming out now which basically being more person-centred, uh, more adaptive treatments that involve um, a lot of assessment. So as someone is being treated, uh, they're measured at regular intervals in order to see whether the treatment is working, whether they're improving, whether they're declining. And once we find that information very quickly and very regularly, we can then adapt the treatments to suit that person's needs. So that's where I think that these, the mm. strong point of these really efficient measures are, are in, in kind of clinical practice. That's fantastic. And do you see implications for kind of the um, alignment of those personalised approaches with the new waves of internet delivered treatment? I could sort of see how yeah. they, they could potentially merge quite well together. Yeah, I mean, these because you need a computer to score these measures, I mean, you can't actually conduct adaptive testing on the fly. Um, it's just too complicated and you'd have to be doing all the algorithms and the, the estimation procedures yourself by hand, which is impossible. So because you need a computer to actually run these algorithms, um, they're, they're well suited for this new kind of online treatments that would actually integrate the assessments within the treatment at a regular point and actually spit out the scores that can be uh, linked to other types of measures that are, are linked on the same metric. So yeah, mm. different, lots of possibilities in that, in that field. Mm. Okay, well that um, 
that links well to a next question that's come through. Um, so, what do you feel are the potential difficulties programming these models into web portals? So, mm. what she's asking is, is it programmer intensive? Um, do programmers yeah. need to understand IRT? Um, or they, or can they, I guess, program it, or, sorry, are the input parameters relatively straightforward for them to program without understanding? Um, great question. This is something that I'm struggling with at the moment. Um, I've actually got kind of all the, the adaptive tests and I've simulated the adaptive test, but now the next step is to actually put them online and actually have a nice interface which is automatically scored and completed. So. Mm. Um, that is a challenge. I, I haven't got any further in understanding um, whether programmers need to have knowledge of IT. I'm guessing that they would. Um, but there is a cool program available in R called um, Mertcat, and that program actually creates, you can, you can actually create a HTML interface for a, a CAT test. Um, and that HTML interface is quite easy and you can actually see it and see all the questions pop up and it's automatically done for you through R. And then that, that spits out your scores at the end. So I'm thinking that um, a programmer might be able to use that particular program in R and um, basically take the HTML that it spits out and put it on a website. I mean, I'm not a computer programmer so I don't actually know um, whether mm. that's possible but it, to me, it seems like it could be possible because they use similar HTML language, so um, it might be a, a definite avenue that um, yeah, yeah. proceed further. But I'm going to be trying to figure out those challenges in the future. So yeah, um, yeah. once I figure them out, then I will share my findings with everyone else. <laughs> okay. Um, Excellent. All right. Well, another uh, question. I was just wondering when you mentioned about um, if one of your earlier papers, you talked about the feedback from I think it was clinicians on mm -hmm. on items as yep. well. And I just wondered how yep. important do you see that? What's the role of that um, feedback, oh. and and how important do you feel it is? I, I think it's very important. I mean, particularly if we're looking at research now as kind of translational research where we want feedback from the people who are ultimately going to be using these instruments. Mm. Um, and particularly, you know, we found it really relevant, really Im important to ask people who have been experiencing these disorders about how relevant a particular item might be. It's all well and good for us the researchers to sit in the, you know, our, our office and think about how people might you know, have symptoms of depression and how we might write that in as a question. But if we go out and actually ask someone, they might think, oh, that's not how I feel. I don't, I don't, I have that, that symptom, but that's mm -hmm. not how I should, how I would word it. Um, or that's relevant to what I think depression is. So um, we found it really important to actually go out and try and um, build some information about how people might think items are relevant. And that, I, I think it's a definite step a good step forward in terms of translation because ultimately these uh, instruments are going to be used by these people so mm. we want to make it closely match their th feelings and thoughts about measurement as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're almost mm. about to say ivory tower for one moment there but I think yeah, every, yeah. everyone <laughs> can see the background here. There's no ivory towers um, <laughs> in sight, just a yeah. pile of office stuff. <laughs> All right, well, I think... Uh, that's all for the questions. You've um, given us so much information and so many resources. Yeah. I imagine people might have additional questions um, along the way. So um, you've got your email in the handout, so do feel free to email those through. Otherwise, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Now, if you can just flick the slide... Matt, and I can remind everyone about the two amazing um, webinars that we have coming up. So in September, Dr. Louise Newton will be talking about the maturing adolescent brain and what does that mean for prevention of drug and alcohol problems. And then in November, we've got Dr. Joanne Ross who will be talking um, about treating depression in the context of substance use, really important topic, and how um, behavioural activation might be particularly useful in that population. So. Um, encourage you to join us for those sessions if they're of interest to you and otherwise thank you again so much Matt for opening our eyes to the world of IRT and CAT and so many other things. Um, so thank you and thank you for joining us everyone and being part of the um, discussion and we'll see you next time. Yes, thank you. Thank Great. you. See ya.